Another mic? Well, good morning and Happy New Year to every one of you. Good morning. I'd like if you would to turn with me to the book of Acts again in chapter 13. This will be our fourth message from this chapter. And if you remember, it's uh, the Apostle Paul is preaching a sermon uh, in Antioch and uh, in Pisidia. And we're going to look at the conclusion of his message and the response to it in this section. So we're going to begin reading in verse 38, and we'll read to the end of the chapter, verse 38 down to verse 52. So Acts 13, verse 38, it says, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, and that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, all that believe are justified from all things from which they could not be justified by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest that come upon you, which is spoken of in the prophets. Behold, ye despisers and wonder and perish. For I work a work in your days a work which you shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. And Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. But they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came unto Iconium, and the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Ghost. God will bless that reading of his precious word to us this morning. So Paul's masterful sermon comes to a close with the words of verse 38 and 39, where he basically presents to them an appeal based on everything he said up to now about Christ and who he is and his death and his resurrection. He says, be it known to you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, through the Lord Jesus is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, all that believe are justified from all things from which they could not be justified by the law of Moses. So he brings it to a climax. And the question is, how are they going to respond? Will they believe Paul's message? Will they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, receive forgiveness of sins and be justified by faith? Something that could never, ever be attained by the law would they do that now although the sermon is connected with how people respond to the presentation of the gospel and we're certainly going to deal with that as we go through the passage but i was thinking again just in the providence of god i'm supposed to be speaking today justin was supposed to be speaking today but we had to switch because of he very graciously agreed to switch 
as I won't be here on the 22nd. But what's interesting is that in the providence of God, we happen to be at this passage this morning, the first day of the new year. And what, it's, what is it about? It's about responding to the word of God. And how will we respond to the word of God? And so it'd be good to ask ourselves a question because 2022 has gone. It's went quickly. Scripture says life is a vapor. And the older you get, the quicker it seems to go. Amen. But we might ask the, the question, during the last year, we have had lots of opportunity to hear the word of God and be confronted with its message for us personally. But how have we responded? How have we responded? Let me suggest some options because th there's different ways you can respond to the word of God. Now, number one, and the most favorable response is to hear it and obey from the heart the message that we've heard. That's a wonderful response, isn't it? A, an obedient heart that says, Lord, yeah, that I, you know, maybe uh, something is shown to me that's just lacking in my life and I see it and convicted by it and I make adjustments and I, I obey the word of God. That's a wonderful, wonderful response. Another response to the word of God is you can hear it and give mental assent to it, but nothing changes fundamentally. Even though we may even have thought about it a lot. Back in the book of Judges, uh, there's a, a, an interesting verse about the, the Reubenites. And, and it talks about them. Well, maybe I'll just read it. So that rather than try and quote it off the top of my head. Judges 5, uh, verse uh, 15 and 16. It says, the princes of Issachar were with Deborah, even Issachar, and also Barak. He was sent on foot in the valley. For the divisions of Reuben, there were great thoughts of heart. Why abodest thou among the sheepfolds to hear the bleating of the flocks? For the divisions of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. And what basically this song of Deborah is saying is it was a day of battle. <clears throat> And it was a day for the tribes to rally and get involved in the conflict against the enemy. And the Reubenites thought about it. In fact, they really searched their heart about it, but they didn't do anything. It just was in the head, but it never transferred into action. And I feel like so often we hear the word of God and we know that God is speaking to us and there are great searchings of heart. But then we go home. And it's business as usual. Nothing changes. Yeah, that's kind of sad, isn't it? But it's, it's, it's quite often the case. Another way you can respond to the word of God is hear it with indifference. Sometimes people just listen and say, so what? <laughs> you know, it's just, they, they don't do anything with it. They don't even think about doing anything with it. They just, it's like almost the routine is you go to church on Sunday, you hear a message, then you go home. And they don't even think about what they've heard. Then a fourth response is hearing it with hostility. That kind of mindset, rebellious mindset, I don't care what God says, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. <laughs> That's a terrible type of response. But I want to suggest to you a major issue in the lives of many of us, myself included, is number two, giving mental assent to truth. I hear it. I know it's true. I know that I need to change. I even think about it. But then I go home and life goes on and nothing changes. So my prayer for all of us is that as we enter into 2023, that it would be a great year of all of us responding to the word of God. Amen. More holiness of life as we're challenged to live like him right to be like the savior be holy as i am holy saith the lord and and so more holy that, that we'd be real holy priests we'd love righteousness and we would hate evil like the lord jesus we'd just be like that loving what he loves hating what he hates more love for the saints we've just come from a conference the thing was one body one life and uh, it's challenging 
to love the brethren. Not always easy. We, we disagree on things. Uh, we, we don't always see eye to eye. But Lord, help me this year to love your people more and to encourage them more to continue in the Lord. One of the characters that was brought to our attention was Barnabas. We've been looking at Barnabas as we've gone through Acts, and he was, he was such an encourager of the saints. He saw the grace of God, and he encouraged them. And th there'd be more of that Barnabas character in all of us. Encouraging God's people to keep on keeping on, to press on, to, to, to grow in grace and the knowledge of Christ. More love for a lost and dying world and more boldness in sharing Christ with them And last year. Lord, we're not good at this. Help us. We want you to hold our hands and walk us through it and help us to be more bold in sharing Christ. More obedience to the commands of Christ out of love for the Savior. Um, if you love me, the Lord Jesus says, keep my commandments. So out of love, just wanting to obey him and, and love him. And then more time meditating on the word of God and less time wasting our time on trivial nonsense. One of the speakers of the conference, very impressive uh, ministry. Uh, and he, I didn't go to the seminar because I, I, I have seminars myself, but I, what I heard from the seminar was that he was telling us that when he preaches, he spends one hour for every minute he speaks. Wow. So that means a 40 minute message, he spends 40, 40 hours. In, and you could tell by listening to him preach. <laughs> he spent a lot of time studying the word of God. And, and it's a challenge. How much time do we waste? Even just uh, one of the things that I, I had the seminar on becoming the people of the book. And uh, one of the things that I mentioned was that I'd been given a seminar at another conference. I didn't say where the conference was, but there were about 60 people in the conference. And, uh, and the, the topic that I was given was Bible study methods, the techniques of how to study the scriptures. And so the first thing I said is the first place you've got to begin is reading the Bible. You've got to start right there. And I asked them how many of them had read through the Bible completely, Genesis to Revelation. Now, there's 60 people there, mature Christians. Less than half a dozen raised their hands and said they'd read through the whole Bible. I was shocked. I was absolutely, totally in a state of shock. And so, by the way, this is January the 1st. And if you want to read through the Bible, they have these reading schedules. They're wonderful things. Uh, you can print them off, uh, or you, it may have on your phone an app that has it. But uh, this is from wholesomewords.org. And it would be great to say, by the grace of God, this year, I'm going to read through the entire word of God, Genesis to Revelation. Now, of course, it gets sticky when you do that sometimes. You, you get to Leviticus, and your will is tested. <laughs> you get to First Chronicles, and the first 11 chapters are genealogies, pretty much. Well, that'll really test you, but let me give you a little handy hint. Uh, I have on my phone a, a little app, and it's got Alexander Scorby reading the Bible. And he reads with Shakespearean English. And so when I get to First Chronicles chapter 11, I read it, but I have him help me with the pronunciation. He reads it along with me, and it helps me get through that kind of time where I'm going to perish at the rocks. It's really helpful. And so uh, there's ways that we can do this. But again, just want to encourage all of us this year, uh, as we start this message, to be more responsive to the word of God. When we look at the response to Paul's sermon here, we see that there are two responses, really, uh, that stand out. And, he, and as he presents to them this message that uh, if they would believe, uh, that they would receive uh, this. If you believe in this man, you'd receive forgiveness and, of sins and you'd be justified from all things that you couldn't from the law of Moses. He, he ends that appeal with a, with a kind of caveat that he throws in here. And it's a warning. And he warns them of the consequences of not responding to the message. And what he says in verse 40 is, 
uh, beware, therefore. So that's a warning. Like when you say to something, beware, you say, look out here. This is a big warning. Beware, therefore, lest that come upon you, which is spoken of in the prophets. It was the prophets have had something to say about this. Behold, he says, you despisers and wonder and perish. For I work uh, a work in your days, a work which you shall in no wise believe, though man declare a man declare it unto you. And so he warns them of the dangers of not responding to the message. And, and he's telling these people, the gospel message, if you reject it, you're going to perish. That's the, that's the ultimate price. If you respond to it, you get forgiveness of sins and you're justified from everything that the law could not justify you from. But on the other hand, if you reject it, he says there's consequences. You're going to perish. And he says, it's interesting. He said the prophets... Well, they not only spoke about Christ and what we saw in the early part of the sermon. The prophets spoke about his death. They spoke about his burial. They spoke about his resurrection. But the prophets also warned about rejecting the message. That some would reject the message. God in his foreknowledge knew that there were some that would, would turn their back on this message. And actually, uh, when he says, uh, let's come upon you, which is spoken of in the prophets, he, he speaks to them from one of the prophets, Habakkuk, in the minor prophets. And it's in Habakkuk chapter one. And it's kind of interesting that he would choose Habakkuk of all the prophets, because many of them talked about this idea of rejecting. Uh, that there would be those that would reject the message. And, and yet Habakkuk, why would he choose Habakkuk? specifically to talk about the danger of rejecting the message because Habakkuk was the prophet that talked about the just shall live by faith wasn't he like three of Paul's epistles are an, an exposition of Habakkuk 2 4 Romans Galatians and Hebrews I mean this the just shall live by faith and so the very same prophet that told us that if we really want life everlasting life and we want to be justified. How do we get it? By faith. And yet that same prophet, Habakkuk 1.5, Behold ye among the heathen, and regard and wonder marvelously, for I'll work a work in your days which you will not believe, though it be told you. And in the context here, what he's, it's a different work that he's talking about, but, it, but he's giving him a warning. If you don't pay attention to the prophets, the Babylonians are going to come and take you into captivity. And they didn't listen to the prophets. And what happened to them? They went to Babylon. Now he's telling us, using the same scripture, Paul is saying, look, if you don't believe the gospel by faith, guess what's going to happen to you? You're going to perish. Just like what happened to them is going to happen. You're going to perish. That's going to be your end. And so he really strongly warns them of the solemn consequences of rejecting light. And it is a very dangerous thing to reject light. Now, verse 42 says, when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now, isn't that encouraging? Remember, in the synagogue, you, you had the Jews, but many of the Gentiles had already become disillusioned with paganism. And they'd already attached themselves to the synagogue. Some of them were proselytes. Some of them were just were just God fearers who come uh, come along to because they wanted to hear this message that was so different to the immorality and the wickedness of paganism. And so, so these that were from this Gentile background that were in the synagogue, they said, "We want to hear more about this." Right? They were, isn't it wonderful when people want to hear more? Amen. Instead of just looking at your watch and thinking, when is this guy going to finish? A hunger for the word of God, an appetite. I want to hear more. I, I can't get enough of this. I want the word of God. It's thrilling when people have an appetite for the word of God. And, and so it was interesting, the conference we just had, the big question, I'm on the committee, and the big question, everybody, when are we going to do it again? Can we do it every year? Because it's a biannual conference, but can't we do it every year? Can we come back here? <laughs> that was encouraging. Right? It's good that people are hungry for the word of God. And so these Gentiles, 
They want to hear more. They're hungry to hear more. And so it says the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath day. Now, again, remember, it's the first time they've really heard this message of Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection and justification by faith. So they want to hear it again. Uh, like it's like this is music to our ears. We need to hear this again. And so verse 43, it says, when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious uh, proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas. And so they're responding. They're saying, we, we like this message. We, we want to follow this. Who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Now, we just see what's going on here. Particularly with the religious proselytes, they've already responded to light in leaving paganism and attaching themselves to Judaism. They've made a big leap. And that was the grace of God working in their lives that took them out of paganism and brought them to seek the truth in the God of Israel. But now he says, continue. Don't stop there. Make the next step. You see, the fulfillment of Judaism and all the, what the prophets have spoken is found in the Messiah, the Lord Jesus. Amen. So you continue in the grace of God. You made a big leap. Now make the next step. Go on and follow and embrace Christ, continue in the grace of God. And so we have verse 44, what happened on the next Sabbath? It says the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. Now, that sounds like revival to me, doesn't it, you? I mean, wouldn't you just love it if like how many, not too many of us here this morning. Wouldn't you love it if the whole city was trying to get in this building to hear the word of God? Amen. Times of revival, there are people actually hanging on the drain pipes, uh, trying to listen from outside. It's quite incredible. I remember reading about revival in Dublin uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, the assembly there, big, big building. Um, and um, Marion Hall was called. And there was an evangelist there. Joseph Den Denham Smith was having gospel meetings and it was packed, and there was those balconies, like there's row, there's several kind of stories packed to the gills, and people were hanging onto the drain pipes, no air conditioning, so the windows were open, and they were hanging on and listening to the message through the windows, and people got saved hanging onto the drain pipes. Isn't that wonderful outside the building? Praise God for that. This is that's what happens in a time of awakening and revival. But here uh, it says, and he's not using just hype hyperbole he's telling us there's a great response here the next sabbath day came the, almost the whole city together to hear the word of god so no doubt these gentiles uh, that have heard this message are telling others and they're coming too and so there's great interest in the word of god and then verse 45 we notice a, a very sad verse when the jews saw the multitudes they were filled with envy you know envy is a terrible emotion. It's a terrible thing. If you look at the word of God, it's an interesting study to study envy. How did Joseph end up in Egypt? Well, his brothers were moved with envy. They didn't like it that he got the special clothing and he was daddy's favorite. And so they, they hated him because they were envious of Joseph. How did the Lord Jesus end up being handed over well, Pilate says he knew that it was because of envy they'd handed him over. The religious leaders were envious of Jesus because he got more of a following than they did. In, in fact, envy begrudges success in anyone else but me. That's what it's really self-centered. It, and it begrudges success. And, and it's a terrible thing. Now Paul and Barnabas are opposed because of envy. And can we just challenge one another not to begrudge the success and the blessing of another person that they experience, but rejoice in it. It's very easy to do, to become crippled with envy. Rejoice that God is blessing someone else, that there's success in what they're doing. Praise God for that. Usually there's a lot goes into that too. They didn't just didn't happen. They, 
Uh, but the, this is what's going on. So the whole city was stirred up with in, interest, showing up at the synagogue. And, and there were those Jews who were saying, well, look at this. All these Gentiles are coming to our meetings and you can't even get a seat anymore. And we don't want these people around because they're kind of spoiling everything for us. We had a nice holy hood before. We didn't have to rush to get a seat. And these people are come in and they make it, you know, and all these riffraff coming into the meeting, right? That's uh, that's the attitude. It was interesting when uh, the revival occurred during the Jesus movement. And Chuck Smith, all these hippies are showing up at his church. And they don't have any shoes on. They're coming in bare feet, you know. Uh, there's a smell of weed on them. Uh, they're wearing kind of, you know, the sloopy stuff and all this kind of, and all these guys in suits and ties and all the rest of it. And they are not happy. And a bunch of them left because they couldn't bear to see these people coming to hear the word of God. Isn't that tragic? And think of the blessing they missed. Because many of these hippies were gloriously saved, transformed. I heard about one of the works and it was done in a, a community somewhere in Oregon. And most of the people that got saved were all nudists. Now that would cause a stir, wouldn't it? <laughs> now they eventually put clothes on because God's word began to have an effect on them. But God did an amazing work amongst those hippies. And again, how, what if 2023, the Lord begins to work in our assembly and people start to come in that don't just look like we look. Maybe they've got tattoos all over them, bones through their noses, you know, look like something out of tribal, a tribal picture. You know what I mean? How do we respond to that? Or somebody comes in and they're dirty. Are we, do we believe the word of God can change them? We don't have to grab them by the door and say, now, you come back next week, but buy a suit. <laughs> then you can come in or whatever, right? God can work. But but they were not happy about this response at all. They were filled with envy. They spake against those things, verse 45, which was spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Of course, blaspheming about the Lord Jesus, because that was the core of the apostles' message. So verse 46, it says, then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. And so what he's saying is simply this, that God has said that the gospel should go to the Jew first. And, you know, it, he came to his own, right? He came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He came to his own and his own received him not. They, we, won't have, we will not have this man to reign over us. So he said, okay, you don't want it. We'll go to somebody that will have it. And so Paul says, you reject it. Okay, we'll go to the Gentiles. And so the Jews, I mean, it's amazing that he uses this. I think it's somewhat Pauline irony here. He says, seeing you see, you judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. I really believe he's being ironic here because the Jews always considered themselves to be worthy. Do you remember the Pharisee and the, and, the, and the publican? I thank you that I'm not like other men. You know, I don't do this and I don't do that. And I do this and, and he doesn't do it. That's how they were. They were full of self-righteousness. And so he says, you Jews who always consider yourself righteous now apparently do not think yourself to be sufficiently righteous to take advantage of God's free gift. So we'll offer it to the Gentiles and see what they have to say. <laughs> and that's what he's saying. Of course, he should know. Because remember what he was like before he got saved? He was the atypical model of a self-righteous pharisee and they're just the same and they said we're not they can sit unworthy of eternal life he said, okay you don't want this we'll go somewhere else In verse 47 but so hath the lord commanded us saying i have set thee to be a light of the gentiles 
that thou shouldest be for salvation to the ends of the earth. So we could almost hear Paul turn to Barnabas and whisper, I was afraid of this. I was afraid this. they're going to reject this, but what we're going to do is we're not going to be deterred. We'll go where they want to hear it. We'll go to the Gentiles. And so he acknowledged his duty was to proclaim the gospel first to the Jews. And he continued to do that to the end of his ministry. He always went to the Jew first, but once they rejected it, then he said, okay, I'm going to go to the Gentile. Now it's the Gentile time to hear the message of life for the ages, eternal life. It's their opportunity. Your rejection has meant this opportunity has been offered to the Gentiles. And he's quoting from Isaiah chapter 49 and verse 6. So often, the Apostle Paul quotes from the Old Testament scriptures, and one of his favorite books is clearly Isaiah. And Isaiah 49, 6, as he said, it is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob, to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation to the ends of the earth. And again, as we've considered this time of the year and the Christmas story, we have that truth reiterated in the birth of the Messiah. In Luke's gospel, chapter 2, and verse 28 through 32, where we read this. Then took he him up in his arms and blessed God. This is Simeon and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And so he says, we're going to go to the Gentiles. We're going to take this message as a light to lighten the Gentiles. And again, how marvelous it is, because how dark was the Gentile world and how light is the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And by the way, our world is getting increasingly pagan and increasingly dark. And the light is to be found in the gospel of Christ. That's what can change men. That's what can transform them. So we get to verse 48. And we're thinking about responses to the word of God. It says, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. Isn't that a great response? They are so glad that, that they have an opportunity to believe this message. They're, they're, one group says, we don't want it. They're throwing it away. They're casting it from them. And the other group says, well, you don't want it. We'll have it. <laughs> Bring it to us. We want this message. And they wanted it. They believed it. At the end of verse 48, you get a very controversial verse. It says, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Now, we've got to talk a little bit about this verse. Because... The verse is, we might call it Calvinistic heartland. And um, I want to just read you some commentaries, uh, just from three different commentaries about this verse. And this, this part of this verse, as many as were ordained to eternal life, believed. I'm not going to tell you who wrote them, but they're well-known and well-loved Bible commentators who have many good things to say. Praise God for their, their, their labor in the word of God. But they say it's difficult, this is number one, to miss the doctrine of God's election here. In other words, these, these that were getting saved, they were ordained to eternal life. In other words, God had determined, I'm going to save some, and these are the some that are going to get saved. Number two, this verse is a simple statement of the sovereign election of God. It should be taken at its face value and believed. The Bible teaches definitely that God chose some before the foundation of the world to be in Christ. And number three, the present verse is an unqualified a statement of absolute predestination. The eternal purpose of God as found anywhere in the New Testament. And many have found themselves stuck in to Calvinistic theology at this entrance way here, this verse. 
Now, I just want to say something, um, I'll say it quite carefully here, that when it comes to Bible commentaries, you can read 20 commentaries and get 30 different answers, okay? So don't just believe the first commentary you read. Ultimately, when it comes to understanding the Bible, we need the Holy Spirit to help us to know what is really going on. And we've got to be like the Bereans, and we've got to search the scriptures, see whether these things are so, and we have to compare the various commentators and pray, Lord, what is this really saying? And of course, one of the things we need to start with is this word ordained, what does it literally mean? And again, it's a translation, actually, it's a translation that goes back to Jerome and the Latin Vulgate, and it has kind of carried on throughout every translation since Jerome. But what does the actual word mean? Uh, the Greek word is a word tasso, T-A-S-S-O. And I'm not probably pronouncing it correctly, but don't worry about that. But uh, Biddle and Scott, in their intermediate Greek-English lexicon, say this. The meaning of the word is to draw up in order of battle, to form, to array, to marshal, to fall in, to form in order. It's a military term, and it's like a fall in line is the idea, okay? And, and so let me just give you the simple explanation of what's going on here. It says, the Jews says, we don't want this. They pushed it away from themselves, but as many as fell in line and said, yeah, we want it, got it. Amen. That's pretty simple, isn't it? They just simply fell in line. They said, we want it. We'll have it. They don't want it. We'll have it. We're going to line up for this. And they got it. And that is from the literal meaning of it. Those who were such as had been raised in order for life eternal believed. So it's a military term to draw up in rank and file, used generally for placing in an orderly arrangement. <clears throat> and so let me, again, some other Bible commentators have to say about this. And uh, it's interesting that they're, they're great Greek scholars on both sides, but uh, here's one. Um, it says, the din of many of a theological battle has raged around these words. And I love that language, the din of many theological battles has raged around these words, the writer of which would have probably needed a good deal of instruction because before he could have been made to understand what the fight was about. <laughs> there was the original guy who heard it would be shocked that there's all this debate over what he said. The original writer. You better explain to me what you're saying. I don't, I don't get this. He says, it would seem much more relevant and accordant with the context to understand the word rendered ordained as mean, meaning adapted or fitted than to find in it a reference to divine foreordination. The reference then should be the frame of mind of the heathen and not the decrees of God. It was the frame of mind of the heathen world was, we'll have it. We want to line up for it. It's not the eternal decrees of God. They're saying the Jews don't want it. We'll have it. And as many as lined up for it, got it. That's what he's saying. A.T. Robertson, a great Baptist Greek scholar, said the Jews here had voluntarily rejected the word of God. On the other side were those Gentiles who gladly accepted what the Jews had rejected. These Gentiles ranged themselves, placed themselves in orderly arrangement, put themselves in line on God's side as opposed to the Jews. This verse does not solve the vexed problem of divine sovereignty and human free agency. There is no evidence that Luke had in mind the absolute decree. I just find that interesting. So here, here we've got two different ways. Now, whatever you decide, I'm not, I'm not going to love you any less. But, but again, I, I don't think we can build that whole doctrine of predestination on this verse uh, when it's really not saying that. So verse 49, it says the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. Because as we've seen, these that, that lined up for it and were thrilled to have it, they couldn't keep it to themselves. And so it spread and it went around the whole region. And, and so then he says, um, but the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city 
and raised persecution in Paul against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their course. Again, motivated by envy, they couldn't bear the success of these preachers. And so they, they used some clout. There were devout women. There were some, maybe these devout Jewish women were married to some of the chief men of the city, like Esther was married to the, the Gentile king. Maybe that was what was one way or another, uh, they, they put some pressure on, and apparently uh, the Roman authorities, based on this Jewish pressure, expelled them because they were disturbing the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. But they weren't too discouraged because, verse 51, they shook the dust off their feet. Just like the Lord Jesus had said in Luke chapter 10, you go. To every city, you present the message, and if they don't receive it, shake the dust off your feet. Move on. Go somewhere else. And that's what they did. They simply took the Lord's words in Luke 10, 11. Literally, they shook the dust off their feet again, and they came to Iconium. They went 80 miles by foot to the next place, Iconium. But they didn't go in any way discouraged, because remember, a lot of these Gentiles had lined up for eternal life. And then they'd spread it throughout the whole. So they're leaving something behind. In fact, when Paul writes to the Galatians, the Galatian churches, well, that would include this church that was now left behind. These believers that had believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And so it says the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. May God fill us with joy Amen. and the Holy Ghost as we go into this new year. And nothing will fill us with joy more than seeing people respond positively to the word of God. Amen. And it starts with us, but may it not end with us. May it come to unbelievers in the darkness and we bring the light to them. And they say, Count me in. I want to line up for this. This is worth having. May God help us in these things. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful that you have made it very clear in your word that you'd have all men to be saved Amen. and come to the knowledge of the truth. You said that you're not willing that any should perish. And you don't have this secret will that means that you don't really mean what you're saying that you only want some to be saved, that you've chosen before the world began. No, you have, Christ died for all. The message is to be preached for all and to be made available to all. And then each individual must make a decision. Am I going to line up for this or am I going to push it away? Oh God, we pray that more and more people in these dark days will line up for this and say, yes, I want this message. Lord, we want to see you work in this coming year. Lord, help us to be responsive to the word of God as we hear it. Lord, we, we want, to, want to be those that are not just heady. You know, we, we, we take it in the head, but it somehow doesn't reach the heart and find expression in the will. Oh, Lord, we want to be changed, not informed, but transformed by the word of God. Would you work in us, Lord? We pray that if the Lord be not come, that in... January of 2024, that will be a different people, that we would have responded throughout this year when confronted with the word of God. We look in the mirror, we'll see what needs to be adjusted, and we'll change to be like the Lord Jesus, to be more like him, less like so. Lord, we long to see you work amongst us. In the name of the Lord Jesus, for his glory, we pray. Amen. Amen. See, right? Yes, I've been good. I actually have been Yes, it's crazy. It's been years since I've seen you guys. Oh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Someone had to make the joke. Yeah. <laughs>